Welcome back to our continuing devotional study on the letter of 2 Corinthians that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. And chapters 8 and 9 concern the raising of a collection from the richer Gentile churches uh, scattered over Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, and then Macedonia and Achaia, which is modern-day Greece. And the collection was going to be delivered to the poorer church in Jerusalem. Now, you might ask, why did they need to raise money for the church in Jerusalem? Well, Jerusalem is where Christianity started, and it was a hostile environment. And so many people who became Christians were alienated from their family, from their occupations, and therefore times were tough for the early Christian church in Jerusalem. Paul wanted to raise money to give to them, to stand in solidarity with them. Remember that Jews, Jewish Christians scattered around the world, would give annual money annually to the church at Jerusalem for support of the temple. That's the background. He had spoken to them about raising money in 1 Corinthians, but it had seemed to fall down on the priority list. And so now he motivates them to complete the work or the promise that they have made and fulfill it. So let's look at the passage today. I'm going to read to you then from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then to us in keeping with God's will. So we urged Titus, since he had early made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. You will see in the passage the word grace is mentioned several times. It is a gift of God, same as the graces of love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, etc., It is a gift of God. It reveals the heart that has been touched by God. This talk on giving has no application to the non-believer. His heart hasn't been touched. This passage and chapter 9 speaks to the believer and our attitude that we should have in giving. And I'm going to glean six points from today's passage. first principle we see in the passage is that when we give, we must give generously. You'll see the verse... Uh, referring to the churches up in the north, that's Philippi and Thessalonica, their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Verse 2. Don't ever be miserly with God. God has blessed us abundantly. He doesn't need our money, but he wants our hearts to give generously. Don't tip God in the sense that you tip a person who's a car guard or with the amount that you buy a newspaper for. You're giving generously to the work of God. That's the first principle of giving. The next principle is to give sacrificially. We read in the passage that the Macedonian churches had given as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. It cost them to give. Their giving wasn't well within their comfort zone. Jesus gave a parable about a rich person pouring money into the offering basket and a a poor widow uh, just putting a farthing in and he said she's more blessed by God because it cost her. It didn't cost the man at all because it was well within his comfort zone. It must stretch us. We must give beyond our ability sacrificially in the same way that Jesus was given sacrificially to us. So we give generously, we give sacrificially. The third thing we give is worshipfully. You'll see in the passage that he makes the comment that They gave themselves in verse 5, first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. So these Macedonian churches gave themselves to God in an act of worship and then contributed. Their giving was actually an act of worship. And it is, in any giving in a church service, it's not just a collection, it's an act of worship, often in response to the preaching of God's word. We give worshipfully. The fourth thing is we are to give completely. They had to complete the promise they had made. Listen to what Paul says in verse 
6. So we urge Titus, since he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. It's no use promising to give money to God's work or making a commitment and not following through. And I think we all do it. At times we say, I'm going to honor God in this particular area in my life. And then I forget to do it. I forget to pay my tithe. And I'm reminded, bring to completion what you've committed in your heart to do. The fifth point is we are to give excellently. And my title is Excel in this grace of giving, which you see in verse 7. But just as you excel in everything, excel in this grace of giving. We are to give with the standard of excellence. We are to do it well, not half-heartedly, not begrudgingly, but we are to do it well in the sense that everything we do for a great king must be with a standard of excellence. In terms of our time, energy, our ministry, do it well for the Lord. And then I want to read the next section from verse 8. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. And here's my advice about what is best for you in this matter. Last year you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. And so the sixth point is we are to give willingly, from a heart that is willing to give. As I said, not begrudgingly. And when we give willingly, we are blessed. It's not the amount you give, it's the attitude that you give with if you give begrudgingly, then with that sort of attitude that says the church is always asking for money, then it's better not to give at all. It doesn't please God. It's not a great thing. But when you give willingly, God is pleased with your response. Remember, God doesn't need your money. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He is the one that's looking to see what his res the response is from his children. So those are the six principles of giving we glean from this passage. We to give generously, we to give sacrificially, we to give worshipfully, we to give completely, we to give excellently, and we are to give willingly. And I want to now read this last section. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn their plenty will supply what you need. Then there will be equality, as it is written, he that gathered much did not have too much, and he that gathered little did not have too little. So God wants equality in our giving, that those who are doing well and are blessed can share with others. I find this illustration helpful. If you had five sweets and you gave them to your son and his four friends, you'd want him to share a sweet with each child, wouldn't you? In fact, if there, were, and it was, if there was another child there, you'd be happy if your son went without so that the other five could all have a sweet. Same principle with God with us when he's blessed us. Now, if we would appreciate that in our child and appreciate this grace shown when he shares his sweets, how much more do you think God appreciates when his children show these principles of giving and giving equality between a group of friends? This chapter concludes with Paul ensuring transparency in the collection and transport of this gift to Jerusalem. For we are taking pains to do what is right, not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of men. When we deal with God's finances, there's got to be transparency and integrity. These are honorable men chosen to transport this money. So there can be no criticism at all. So this whole exercise of raising money for the church in Jerusalem would be a testimony to God in the way it was raised, the principles of giving utilized by the people, and the way it was taken and shared and dispersed back in Jerusalem. Christ will always be our example that he laid aside his majesty in heaven, says Philippians 2, and became like one of us and became poor and despised and rejected that you and I could have life and inherit the glorious riches of heaven. He's our model. Let's respond as his people so that the father might be proud of his children. Come, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the passage we looked at today. We pray we would always have generous hearts and apply these principles of giving in our own lives, that we might in some sense resemble 
Jesus and what he did, and we might please the Father through our attitudes. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow.